I went to work for Khalida in 1961. I was their first designer, and my design room was no bigger than a tiny closet. And I hired a sample maker, and in fact, when I say a closet, I mean a closet. It used to be used for the, you know, the rooms and the sweeping materials, etc. The room was a small table against the wall with the shelves above it for fabric. The sample maker was behind me, and an ironing board that was hinged to the wall so that if I wanted to get out, I had to go and lift up the ironing board from this hinge in order to get out of the room. It was so tiny. But from that, it was an interesting business. They were, this was a company that had used to make parochial school blazers and pleated skirts and camp shorts. And it was a small factory up in Peekskill. And yet they had what I call a real young lion who had come into the company. It was his father's business originally. And his father passed away and he'd come into it. And a gentleman who was very much like the entrepreneur that Jack Baker was. He was a man who really went on to developing quite a lot of interesting businesses mm -hmm. later on in his career. A man named Edgar Schlossberg. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, uh, Kalita was bought by Majestic. Right. And he went on to form uh, a number of other companies in the last one before he, I think he has just retired from the industry, rather young, but has retired, which was the Ron Chereskin operation mm -hmm. before they sold right. it to Arrow. But Edgar wanted to do something with this company, and he thought that designing the junior product was one way, and he was right. And we really created a lot of history in our own small way. The giant in the industry at that time was a company called Bobby Brooks. And, but Brooks was a very structured middle of the road company and so at Kalida we could do things they could never do. So it was the beginning of a new kind of venture for them, but it was a continu continuation of the designer junior sportswear that country set had been and the only rival country set had at the time was a company called Petty, which was real manufacturing and that was the all of the, uh, the various Glenn family, and uh, they came out of Milwaukee. Rhea is R-H-E-A. R-H-E-A, and out of that came Petty, out of that came uh, a dress division called Joan Miller, out of that came um, the, uh, the actually the training ground for so many people that are in our industry today. I think Petty, was to the right to out uh, to the manufacturing end what a company like United Merchants or, or Lowenstein was in the textile area where people went to work for various people. In fact, my current boss, Art Ottenberg, worked at Petty as a uh, manager of the Joe Miller dress division mm -hmm. because he came from that end of the world and knew the, the Glens and his first designer was Liz Claiborne. I see. So it's Funny how, right, how everything yeah. comes together. But Petty was a company that also did design sportswear. So now Kalita was entering this world at one price point lower. They were the designer higher price points and we were the lower price points. And it was a really, again, a place where you had to be very creative, use very lovely fabrics, less expensive than what I had done before, but very, very creative a little more middle of the road than mm -hmm. the country set had been. And uh, it was here that I began to learn, really learn, what I call conceptual thinking to putting a product on together. And not just reacting to a piece of fabric. So that you started with an idea of what you wanted your line to be of, in terms of where you wanted, what type of price point you wanted, what type of custom you wanted to go after, and one type, what type of end use you wanted your clothes to fulfill. Now, are you giving credit for that to Mr. Schlossberg? Edgar Schlossberg, Edgar Schlossberg is Schlossberg. a gentleman that taught me the what the showroom was all about right. and what selling clothes <coughs> was all about, and taught me how to be a merchandiser when merchandising my ideas before I made up indiscriminately every idea that came to me. You know. I mean, just because I sketched it out didn't mean that it was great. Right. Learned, I learned how to be an editor by working with this man. And 
it was it was a skill that really served me very well because I don't think he realized he was teaching, mm -hmm. but he was, and uh, I learned my lessons there very well because I subsequently went on to work for Petty, which was the, ju the junior sportswear company. That is PETTI. -T -T PETTI, and probably of all of the creative areas that I have been in in the 33 years of my industry, that job was the most creative simply because their position in the market demanded that they be the most creative. What do I mean by that? Well, up until this point, we would go and look at a fabric line, for instance, and even a country set which did expensive things, we would combine fabrics or patterns, but they had already been created. And certainly up at, at, at Kalita, we would look at things, and. At best, what we would do is we would dye our own colors in something. It was still already an established fact that if you wanted to print, you use the print, you might recolor it to go with your group. Basically, you used material already developed. And did you get it exclusively? And you got it exclusively. But at Penny, you went one step further. You took the conceptual thinking and you created everything. You created the fabric, and you had to learn how to create fabric. You started from scratch. It wasn't good enough to just take an idea, just to take a fabric and, run, and, and put some colors into it and put a pattern to go with it for your blouses and shirts, and that was a group. You started with an idea of what the group should look like, and you went and made the fabric to make that group happen. Or you saw unusual fabric from unrelated areas. I remember one year at Penny doing a white group, a white herringbone fabric in cotton, which had a spearmint green pinstripe every every one inch there was a thin line, and we put this with spearmint green foil and little white flowers. But the fabric for the group, the base fabric, existed, except it didn't exist in the fabrics for ready to wear. Mm -hmm. It happened to be the uniform cloth made for the Coca-Cola company. <laughs> And it was that kind of creativity that you did. Or we found a stocking, a knitted stocking from, that was made in Portugal. And it was an interesting knit pattern. So we took the pattern and both printed it and knitted it and made a coordinate group on it. And so you keep saying we, is that an editorial we? Editorial we, yes. Because how I worked, for instance, at Petty is I would develop my ideas. And yet, let's say any given season, I, I would have to do four groups or five groups, mm -hmm. I would put together my ideas and present them to the principals of the company or the principal of this company with another gentleman that was probably the creative catalyst. I learned my merchandising from Enke Schlossberg. I learned how to be open-minded and learn how to create from a gentleman called Bruce Glenn. I find that second to none. He was not a creator. He stimulated the creativity, and he, he brought out the very best in every desire that worked for him. So I learned how to do this, so the we in this case is we meaning that we as a company did this, but I put these ideas together, and he would look at them and decide which of these ideas, because there are always too many, mm. that I should then pursue and create. Right. And that's what I would do. But you started totally from scratch. And it was also at Petty that I learned how to design sweaters. Because sweaters was something that, in you know, these other companies we had sweaters, but you had a sweater man or a consultant who would bring you ideas that you just selected and then they would make them up in your colors. You never designed sweaters. Well, I didn't know that I was going to design sweaters when I went to Petty, but I was informed and uh, you know, later on, you know, you will develop your sweater groups. And I said, what sweater groups? I had no idea what it was all about. But I was fortunate. I was assigned a technician who took me with him to the knitting mills in Cleveland, because in those days, you knitted all in the United States. And I learned what knitting machines were about. I also had a wonderful <coughs> man. I, if I didn't know something, or if I tore a picture out and I asked him what it was about, he would explain it to me. So you began to learn how to 
create, especially in the knitting industry, you have to know what the technical aspect of it is in order to create your product, because you're starting with nothing. But it, it was probably the most creative job that I ever, ever had. Each group of merchandise had to be unique, from, from concept on. And again, that, that was a wonderful training because, interestingly enough, I went back to work at um, Country Set mm -hmm. for one year, and then Bruce Glenn, by then the penny business had been sold, and he was a consultant, and Bobby Brooks had hired him. And he brought me in to work at a, in a small division of Bobby Brooks, which was a junior, was, was a junior petite, and six months after that, I became the design director for Bobby Brooks, working again now with designers. But this was not really on a magnified scale. It was the first time. It was a very difficult transition, working with designers and not doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. But because I've had two kinds of training, the conceptualizing from Edgar and learning how to be truly creative with Bruce, it was not difficult. The only difficult thing was in learning how to work with the designer so that you got their input first, thought about it, and then repackaged the whole thing into commercial ideas, and then sold your management a bill of goods on the directions each line should take. Which would have to be different for each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then to proceed and get the product developed without destroying the creativity of the designers that work for you. Were those designers stationed in um, um, New York? In New York. Yes, they oh, were. Right. In the Bobby Book setup, they were all entirely here. Okay. Uh, rather elaborate kind of facilities. But it required a very special kind of designer because if they were really uh, very, very um, aggressive, and had any kind of ego at all, it was a difficult position for them because they always were faceless you know, in this kind of situation. And uh, we had, I would say, a great turnover. They became technicians to a great degree. To They became extensions of myself. It was unavoidable because of the amount of product that had to be developed on a continuous basis. Uh, so I restructured the company after a while so that we had, and I was learning all this as I was doing it, because I had never directed this kind of thing before. And I discovered that I needed a good assistant who was, uh, in a sense, the head designer to work with designers. <coughs> and I needed a good assistant who did research and development in fabrics. Mm -hmm because we were creating all our own fabrics, because we worked so early, we worked so far in advance of the season, we didn't have the luxury of waiting to see product line. And so we would get young designers who would come in who would feed us ideas. I would digest the ideas and come up with the concepts, play it back to my head designer, who would then work with the designers to develop the specific styles. We needed three pants in this group, what should they be, that kind of thing. I still was the final editor. And that's how we functioned, and I was there for about 12 years. And uh, it was a learning experience, it was a growing experience. Uh, it was also the very beginning of going to Europe, really for the, I had started to go before, but frankly it was at Bobby Brooks, where you started to go to Europe to see, shop the stores, mm -hmm. to shop uh, the, if you could get in to. This is now in the, in the 60s. This is now 1967. Mm -hmm. 19, just to go backtrack, when I went to work at Petty in 1964, if you want to ask how long ago did the French ready-to-wear business really begin to become some, a, a product, well, they always had ready-to-wear, but designer sure. names as such that were not couture designers. I would say you have to go back to no earlier in 1964. And I remember the first of the designers that we uh, saw were people like Emmanuel Kahn, mm -hmm. 
who came into the business street, they were Chino group with these giant industrial zippers. I remember going to Europe in 1965. I went with uh, one of the people from Toby. She mm -hmm. was going for the first time. I believe Barry Lipp, who's still there, was going there and list of these funny stores and people that we had never heard of. Uh, there was a Laura shop out on the Avenue General Leclerc. And who owned the Laura shop? A lady named Sonia Riccio, together with her then husband, Sam. And she was a young, trendy junior designer. And you had the star of that, of Red at the time, the biggest business of all was Casherell. And what did Casherell make? Crepon shirts at that time. He was a blouse maker. So you were at the infancy of the French ready to wear. Daniel Hester had inherited a coat and suit tailoring contracting business from his father and continued to make tailored coats and suits. So when you look upon what seems like a business that had been around forever, it really wasn't. It was in this relatively short period of time. But rather rapidly, the influences that these people had became very important. You had uh, Jacqueline Jacobson, to, together with her husband, that formed the, had a little store called Dorothy Beast, which is still there. Um, these were the new creators, the new input. A magazine that we all kind of looked at but never told any, each other about was Elle. Elle had descended upon the American market in the early 60s. Very few people knew about it, and nobody was telling anybody else about it either, because it really had astonishing merchandise in it was really all of these people's product. So now, when I got to Brooks, and we needed creative input all the time, I started to go to Paris. And then to, to London, of course, it was the London of Mary Quant, mm -hmm. which was the, the hot number at the time. And through the years, other areas developed. We had the, the, the explosion in Copenhagen, where we had a whole group of companies, stores like Deris and Bristol, and How do you spell Deres? D-E-R-E-S. I believe that chain of stores is still there. And they used to create their own product. It was the age of the mini skirt. And you could find a million and one variations there. And uh, we went to uh, wherever we felt there was a new product. We had, I remember venturing into Stockholm at that time. Nothing ever really had happened with that. But we were so anxious for a new product. Uh, then later on in the 60s, I'm sorry, it must have been the early 70s by then, we had Milan with the Fiorucci's and all of that beginning to be important. Uh, so you had to constantly travel. In those days, I made like six trips a year to Europe. Saint-Tropez had emerged yes. upon the scene. And if you remember that for years, the only shop in Saint-Tropez was shows mm -hmm. in the early, in, in his so early stages. Also Vachon. And Vachon, right. And what did they make? T-shirts. It was that's all it was. But you began to discover this whole new influence. And so by the middle 70s, it was, com it was imperative that you see that product line because it did influence what you did. Uh, so off we went. I remember the last week of June was always where I went to Saint-Tropez because it was early enough so that you didn't get the typical tourist. You got a certain fashion-minded person. But late, but, and also early enough so that you could still incorporate that into your plans for spring and summer product line. And of course, later on, the world discovered it. And then stores started to proliferate down there to the point where they became extensions of the Paris store, so it no longer had its uniqueness. But in those days, there were stores that only created product there. The first Sasha, before they went to Paris, was there. Uh, the first of so many stores. Micmac had been a Saint-Tropez, uh, of Saint-Tropez origin, and was terrific. They were wonderful ideas that could be translated. These were real clothes, real sportswear. You didn't only copy, because you couldn't just copy it. It had a different point of view in that respect, but you had input in new fabric, new proportions, new ideas, and it was fantastic for that. So that was a, a, a fresh input into a you know, volume junior sportswear manufacturer. In those days, Bobby Brooks's volume was $100 million, unheard of in the business, and had peaks and valleys because it was so vulnerable. 
But, and I stayed with them, developing product, up until, I would say, the late 70s. At which point, I did what I would call just a straight switch, and I joined a competitor, which was College Town. And I didn't stay there very long, because I had begun to feel, even my last years at Bobby Brooks, something was changing in the industry. And I didn't feel that the junior business, as we had once perceived it, was any longer valid. And of course, now it's 1985, and in point of fact, it's come to pass. And today, junior business is nothing but a price-oriented, item-oriented industry. Mm -hmm. So I stayed with it for a brief period of time, and left there, and did nothing for six months. It was my luxury of deciding what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and where I was growing. I also felt that I wanted a more sophisticated, a more updated product. I was growing as a designer. And in the last years of Bobby Brooks, I had already begun to put that, that input into the product line. And interestingly enough, the customer, the customer must have also responded to it. Because we did very well with, quote, uh, more designer-oriented influences than the big star at that time was Ralph Lauren at the beginning of Polo and his real very chic classic clothing. And I really tried very hard to bring that taste level into the junior market and it really started to work. And it was really the beginning of a change in the business. And so I began to see that my level of merchandise, my taste level, was shifting away from cutesy, gimmicky, real young kind of thing. And so after a six-month hiatus, I joined the company to be the designer. I went back to be just the designer because of College Town, I was also the design director and merchandiser. Oh, College Town, right. But now I decided I was tired of large companies. I wanted small businesses. I wanted something where I was back in the product. So I joined the division of Country Miss, which made had various product lines. They had a dress line, they had a moderate price sportswear line, and they had begun to dabble in a little line called Weather Bay, which was a better Missy sportswear business. And they did about four and a half million dollars. Considering that I'd come from College Town, which was also an excess of a hundred million dollar business, it was a very difficult transition, not from the designer point of view, but because I was so used to being able to get things done by staff. Right. All I had to do was say, I want to do X, Y, and Z. I want to do this kind of plaid or that kind of print, and I had people who created it. Now, I had to do it. I had to work with the resources and directly develop it again. I also had to develop designs, but that wasn't difficult. So I really enjoyed the whole back to designing activity that I had at Leather Bay. I worked with a pattern maker who was my assistant and looked at muslin fittings again. I really loved it. It was, it was a wonderful luxury. But it also began to grow. And, I, and it was ironic because my boss was a man who was very satisfied with the size of business that he had. Because collectively, the business, the various divisions that they, they were about a 65, $70 million business, and he had just sold it to the heart marks people. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't really interested in, you know, exploding anything further than where it was. The healthy growth each year was wonderful. But despite his uh, modest attitude towards business, the business grew in three years' time to almost $26 million, four and a half, because it was a product that had validity. I did everything. I did the designing, the fabricating, the merchandising, everything that had to do with it. I also, this was the first time I also went off to Hong Kong to design sweaters. I had never done that in the Far East. We did produce product in the Far East and some of the other companies that I worked for, starting with the late 70s with Bobby Brooks. However, uh, you, we sent knitwear designers over. Now, I did it all. 
So off I went, and it was a wonderful learning experience, learning how to produce product. Then, while I was there, about three years ago, uh, Art and Liz had asked me, would I like to join their company? And I went to visit their company, and by then, of course, they were already rolling along rather strongly. And it was really the kind of thing that I had been running away from, the large-scale business. By then, there were also over a $100 million business. I think by then, there were probably about a $150 million business. And today, of course, they're $300 million. And I, it was exactly what I had not wanted. And I walked through the, like, some of the merchandising offices, and I saw these online computer terminals, and I saw these online computer terminals, and I saw the masses of people that had to keep track of everything that was happening, and I said, it just, wasn't not, it just was not what I wanted. I liked the idea of going back to designing my own product, and being involved in a nice small business where you controlled everything. And so I said, I didn't think that I, I really wanted the job. Well, two years later, I guess because I was more, more ambitious to make this business grow, which couldn't grow because the principal of the company had just determined that he wanted to keep it small and contained. So again, I had come back from Hong Kong and they approached me again. Would I like to join them in the capacity of design director? And this time I didn't say no so quickly because I thought, well, maybe I've grown past that need and I'm ready to go back into this. And I said, before I say anything else, I would like to see the product line. So off I went to the showroom and I sat and I, one of the salespeople showed me the product line. It was overwhelming. I, be, I, I looked at it and I said, I don't know how anybody could take on this magnitude of job because what they have created is so awesome. And I really had to think about it long and hard. Now this was in early October, two years, uh, early October would have been October 83, middle October of 83. It wasn't until mid-December that I finally said yes to it because <coughs> it was scary. The product line, the, the diversity of the product line and the amount of creativity that goes into it was, and, and the excellence of the creativity that, go, that went into it made you say, maybe you really have self-doubts because while you might have all the skills to make something like this happen in terms of getting it done, I didn't know if I had the talent hmm. to make this happen. And it didn't mean that I was going to personally design all this because there, there's a staff of designers. But just to be the guiding light, the inspirer, the, the teacher, the director, is a very, very awesome responsibility. And it took me several months to, to make up my mind as to what I was going to do. And of course, I decided to join them. And it was a very exciting moment for me. But I must say, I joined them in January of 84. It was probably the last year was the toughest year of my life because it called upon everything that I had learned in 32 years. And I said to a lot of people that I think that all of my experience of 32 years was made so that I could now take this job. Because it required you to be a technician, a conceptualizer, a merchandiser, a fabricator, a director of people, and I'm sure I left a lot, and an administrator. It, it's all of those skills rolled up into one. And it also requires you not to have an ego, because there's no, no time or place for it. And you kind of have to learn not to be in awe of Liz Claiborne, who is a terrific person in terms of just from the talent alone, to have created this and made this happen. It's a rough act to follow, and I remember saying the same words to her 
right after seeing the very first fashion show that I saw in January, even before I joined the company, I said, oh, this, this is a very difficult act to follow. Uh, it's awesome. And it's only after the middle of last year that you begin to fall into the tempo of how a product has to be done. Mm -hmm. The line is very extensive. It's, uh, it's extensive in its uh, variety. It's three lines in one. Each line has a spectator, which is the ready-to-wear portion, a sport, which is more casual, and the liswear, which is more active and gene-oriented. And there are six line releases a year. Every two months, a fresh line of product going into the stores. Every two months, a line opening. So that calendar that you are, that I think you're, you should be really famous for, it works very well here. I mean, yes. I remember you showed me it a long time ago. Oh, yes. And the time period is a whole block. Oh, yes. Actually, it's even more complicated because we don't even have the luxury of that amount of time as we had mm -hmm. when I gave you that calendar. Okay. Now, uh, could we just, I just want to relate this that a little bit to uh, FIP. Were there, as you went along, any courses that you wish they had given that would have saved you time? Yes. I was also thankful for things that they had given us, but they hadn't given us enough of. The textile courses were very uh, uh, general and perfunctory in my estimation. They gave you a basic knowledge of weaves, uh, of uh, different kinds of cloths, uh, so that you could also know that that's a woven fabric and that's a knitted fabric. But they didn't give you anything more than that. They didn't teach you textile design. If I were going to do those courses today, I would say, interestingly enough, I would say, interestingly enough, they, didn't, they did certain things which were not as important. When you took design, apparel design, you were stuck <coughs> with, at some point, millinery design. Whether you wanted it or not, you had to minor in the millinery design. That, to me, was worthless in retrospect. Yes, and of course they discontinued that right. department. So but what they should have done, and of mm -hmm. course hindsight is always mm -hmm. greater, is the textile design courses should have been broader mm -hmm. to, to let you know that you are going to be called upon to create fabric. But they didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Because the world that we were living in at the time didn't demand that of, of us. But I would wish for greater depth in design of textiles. And I don't mean just the technical aspect of it. I mean creating from an idea, or taking an idea mm -hmm. and working it all the way through. Uh, I would also wish that they had given us knitting courses. But who knew that the sweaters were going to be such? Well, did you ever communicate any of this to them? Because they do give those things now. Today? Yes. Today. But by now, of course, I know I've learned the skills. You see, I had right. to learn it by being thrown into the pool right. and saying sink or swim. But in those days, they didn't. But I don't think they do things still the way I would do it. If I were teaching a course, I would take and say, okay, let's learn conceptual thinking. Mm -hmm. Take an idea. If you, if you have a particular feeling for a mood of clothing, Develop it. <coughs> Develop it from its textile right through to its finished style and merchandise it as you do it so that you could take an idea and create a sportswear group starting with your idea. If your idea, for instance, is Provence prints and yarn dyes mixed together, the idea that we just did, start from scratch as we did. We created a yarn dye pattern in a color range that we like and develop Provence patterns. Do research and then create your own. Two different ones that have to work with each other and work by themselves. Take an idea like that and make it become a real piece of merchandise so that you actually have created the total product. That's something they don't teach. And I know it's something maybe you will learn when you get out there, but you know it's something you really should know before you get out there. Mm -hmm. Learning how to do it. It's the how to do it skills that I would like to emphasize uh, at the creative level, not so much the technical level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need the technical level. You need to get a job. So you've got to perform a technical function. 
you also need to know what can be done and what can't be right. done to know what. But somehow, I mean, if you're going to go as a, as get a job as a sketcher, you have to know how to sketch. If you're going to get a job as a sample maker, you have to know how to make clothes. If you're going to get a job draping patterns, you have to know those skills. That's your door, foot in the door. But you also have to know how to create a product. And it's not just making an isolated picture. And that is what they still tend to do. And it drives me crazy because I've done, uh, spent time at the school and, or as the critic for some of their sportswear mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. And the frustration is incredible because people don't think in concept form. They think in specific garment form. And until you break that habit, you really can't think the way the industry wants you to. And that's, I would say, that if I had courses like that, it would have been fantastic to make you rethink everything in a different manner. Mm -hmm. I remember when I used to design for my portfolio. Each plate was a, a, a production unto itself and contradictions in silhouettes. Because if I felt that something was, uh, uh, this one garment should be a big full-skirted, lifted waist, I did that. And then the next one would be uh, a slim, uh, whole other silhouette, there was no continuity of idea. And they still tend to do that. Maybe it's indigenous to design schools, I don't know. Well, and if a design school uh, like FIT wants to stay up to the very moment, mm. therefore this kind of critique or suggestion is not very valuable. If I, if I were going to retire from the industry, or even even at this point, where would I like, what would I like to do personally at this point? I would love to teach. Mm -hmm. I would love to teach the craft, how you make things happen, and what the thoughts are that go into it. Not the dressmaking skills or the pattern making skills. Those are what I call givens. You must have them. But just how to take and maximize a creative talent you have inside, but don't know how to <coughs> put it together, package it, conceptualize it. That's what I would love to do. Would you ever have uh, thought that it would be useful to have more uh, business training, business management? Yes, that's the other part of it. When I came out into this business, I knew nothing about how businesses run. I knew nothing about how you administrate a business. Perhaps if I did, I might have gone into my own business, but it was always a very frightening mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of the business. I also think that if I were to do it all over again, somewhere in my 33 years, I would have liked to have gone to work for a retailer. I think that understanding the retail business helps you become a better designer. Understanding what it means getting merchandise on the floor. What, what about presentation? What about how you sell to the customer? What about what the other needs were? What means markdowns? I think it was years before I even knew what that word meant. Because mm -hmm. you were so isolated from it. Mm -hmm. And it's very important. I don't know whether the courses include that today, that even if you're a design major, you must have merchandising and retail-oriented courses. I don't know if they do that. But if they don't, they should. Because those two areas, the business, the administrating of a business, and the retail experience, those are the key ingredients to making you the very best design. Because even today, when we work on product, we're always aware of how will the package look on the floor? How will, how will the retailer house what we're going to ship with? What are the price points that we want our merchandise to be at? And what segment of the consumer are you targeting? Exactly. For? You have to do it. In fact, I had a meeting just this Friday where in order to know what price fabric we can afford for the coming season that we're working on, we had to know what price points we wanted those garments to be at mm -hmm. so that we would not violate that and find that we love a fabric and then after we bought the fabric, we're making garments that are far too expensive for our customer. Know your customer and that's what the retail experience we give you. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had had it earlier. I think I would have been a better designer. Hmm. That's very interesting. I thank you very much. I really do. It's My pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you.